I'm going to uh, start talking just to uh, tell you guys what I'm up to right now. Um, you know, we had an election last week, um, and a lot of votes are counted by electronic tallying machines, whether these are actually electronic voting, touchscreen voting machines or you vote on paper by marking in a bubble or connecting a candidate to an office by drawing a line or something like that. Pretty much all the votes in the U.S., except for New York, which is still using mechanical lever machines, pretty much all the votes in the U.S. are counted electronically in, in some manner. And uh, so the accuracy of that is not perfect. I mean, the accuracy of any counting system isn't perfect. And that raises the issue of uh, might there have been enough error in the counting of the votes in an election to cause the wrong candidate to appear to win? You know, can you get the wrong answer because of error in the vote tallies? So for, uh, for a few years, I've been working on the problem of auditing elections statistically. So you go back in and hand count a random sample of the ballots and look at the errors in the counting of those random samples and use that to try to figure out whether the total error uh, in counting all the votes might be large enough to cause the wrong candidate to appear to win. <clears throat> And uh, we're going to learn a little more about techniques for drawing samples. I can explain a little bit more carefully what's going on. But it, what it amounts to is a what would be called a cluster sample, random cluster sample, or a stratified random cluster sample of ballots, where the clusters in this case are those ballots that were cast in a particular precinct, or those ballots that were cast in a particular precinct on a particular machine. Um, or in a particular mode, like count cast by mail versus cast in person in the precinct. <clears throat> so uh, I've done four experiments so far in different counties in California uh, working on this. I did some work for the Secretary of State's office back that kind of kick, kicked this all off, but I've done, done work in four counties, uh, two audits in Marin County, an audit in Yellow County, which is up, uh, uh, Davis is in Yellow County, and an audit in Santa Cruz County. And uh, doing some more audits using better methods that are more efficient. They don't require as much hand counting when the outcome is right, but they're guaranteed to have a minimum chance of going to a full hand count if the outcome is wrong. Because the only way you can correct an outcome is to to count everything by hand. You can't um, you, you can't sort of extrapolate the results from a sample and determine the outcome of the election based on that extrapolation. That would <clears throat> probably be unconstitutional because there would be a chance you'd make a mistake. And if you made a mistake, in, eff in effect, you would be disenfranchising the majority um, by having committed a statistical, you know, you know, just a, by luck of the draw, you got a sample that caused the extrapolation to be wrong. <clears throat> so you basically have two options. You either stick with the outcome that the original tally told you, or you count everything by hand and get a manual tally. And the manual tally is then the, um, the, the legal the legal standard that determines the, uh, the winner. So, um, uh, so far we've been lucky in the audits. We haven't found enough error that would trigger us to go and do a full hand count. We've been able to certify all the outcomes. And uh, tomorrow I'm heading to Yolo to audit another couple of contests. And next week we'll be doing an audit of a couple of contests in Marin County. Um, so we're actually going to learn a lot of the the math on which, on which this stuff is based. There are bits and pieces of it in today's lecture. And then when we start talking about sampling, there's bits and pieces of it there. So this is one practical application of statistics in, in political life and civic life. Are there any questions before we get going? Smaller and smaller. People starting their Veterans Day holiday early. <clears throat> Sorry? What am I doing next week? Next week is Marin County. This week is Yolo County. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the protest. Oh, I haven't. Uh, I haven't paid any attention. There's. Uh, this is another walkout or something. Three-day walkout. Okay. We're angry about the tuition hike. You want to walk out? <clears throat> All right. Um, I'll need to give it some thought. Uh, yeah, we, I honored the, the other protest day. Uh, I need to think about this one, look at the details. Um, 
It's a lot of school to miss. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's hard all around. I mean, you know, our, our salaries have been cut by 10% roughly. And, uh, you know, our workload has not been cut. Um, <laughs> Sorry? This semester it's cut. Yeah. No, don't quit this semester. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, yes, question. Quit and give you A's. Okay, yeah, as a parting gesture. Yeah. They're much higher at, at, at privates in general. We're actually, um, Berkeley, there's a comparison eight universities that we, we consider to be, you know, in some sense, roughly comparable. Of course, we consider ourselves to be the best, but, you know, <laughs> roughly comparable. And it's a mix of, of privates and publics. And our salaries are substantially behind the salaries of the, of the, uh, the comparison institutions. And there, were, there was a commitment on the part of the administration to try to accelerate our salary growth to catch up with everybody else. But I think by now we're, we're much more than 30% behind. Um, it's really, uh, because isn't Berkeley a nice place to live? Wouldn't you pay to live here? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, the, the politics are beyond me. Um, anyway, no, it's not happy making uh, for faculty. But um, anyway, well, let's, sorry? Yeah, yes, the, some administrators make quite a bit more than the faculty, and some faculty make quite a bit more than other faculty. And the, I mean, one of, the, one of the issues that's happened is that academic salaries um, really took off in a number of fields in, uh, in the late 80s. And if you were hired before then, your salary is sort of behind people who were hired after then, unless you threaten to leave and get competitive offers from other institutions that Berkeley considers to be of the same caliber. Um, so I I if you're really willing to leave, then that's something to do. But if you're not really willing to leave, it doesn't seem like it's the right thing to do to put a bunch of other people through a lot of trouble to make an offer, evaluate you, have, I mean, so forth and so on, only to try to drive up your salary at your home institution. So, yeah. All right, statistics. <laughs> not salary statistics. But. Um, okay, we've been talking about calculating probabilities and probability distributions of random variables and uh, calculating the probability that a random variable will be in various ranges. And that's all great. There are situations where calculating the probability exactly is just incredibly complicated or time consuming or, or in effect impossible. And in that case, it's useful to have some approximations for the probability. And what this chapter is about is three different kinds of approximations. The first approximation you know, really is a, it's an approximation to the distribution that says that the probability histogram of some random variables can be approximated well by a curve. And that particular curve that we're going to talk about is the normal curve, which if you've had statistics before, you've seen it. Um, we'll talk about when that approximation is good, when that approximation isn't good, what kinds of random variables that applies to. The other two quote unquote approximations are really not, they're not approximations in the same sense, they're bounds. Just like uh, Chebyshev's and Markov's inequality we had for lists, there's an analog of Chebyshev's inequality and of Markov's inequality for random variables. And in both of them, you basically are just changing the word uh, uh, mean of a list to the expected value of a random variable and standard deviation of a list to the standard error of a random variable. And other than that, the, the definitions are exactly parallel. And in fact, the proofs are basically the same. Um, so we'll get there uh, today. But first, let's talk about the normal approximation to the probability distribution of the sample mean and sample sum of draws from a box of tickets. So this curve here is the normal curve. And it, um, it has. Uh, the equation y is equal to 1 over the square root of 2 pi e to the minus x squared over 2. <clears throat> um, now, what I want you to, I don't care whether you memorize this or not, but what I want you to recognize is how it depends on x. 
it depends on x only through the value of x squared. So if you plug in x and you plug in minus x, you get the same value for y. It's symmetric. Okay? The other thing you should notice is e raised to a negative power gets smaller and smaller and smaller the bigger that negative power is. Right? So the maximum value of this occurs when x is equal to 0. So this thing is a bump at 0. It's symmetric, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller the further away you get from 0. Right? Now, in order to go, if you notice that this curve that's plotted here isn't centered at 0. It's centered at 6. Okay? There's been a change of variables. What's happening is that we're really thinking about things in terms of standard units rather than in terms of the original units. So this curve, I could, <clears throat> let me, I'll, I'll phrase it the other way around. The curve is a good approximation to some probability histograms if first you transform the random variable to standard units. Now, what is standard units for a list of numbers? That's a concept we've had. We don't have standard units for random variables yet. But for a list, how do you change a list to standard units? Okay, so you, you take, the, you take the, the original value minus the average of the values, the mean of the values, divided by the SD of the list. Right? That's how you take a value and put it into standard units for a list. Yes? For a random variable, the way you change values of a random variable into standard units is quite parallel. It's the original value minus the expected value divided by the standard error. Okay? Yes? This is how you turn a random variable into standard units, values of a random variable. Okay? So to put, it's the original, it's the variable minus its expected value over the standard error. So if I take x minus the, minus the mean of x and divide that by the standard error of x, that's a new random variable, right? It's a function of the old random variable. What have I done to it? I've subtracted something and I've scaled it. Yes? I can actually write that as 1 over the standard error of x times x minus the expected value of x over the standard error of x. Yes? Did I do that right? This is a constant times a random variable plus another constant. Yes? This looks like a times x plus b, where a is 1 over s e of x and b is minus e of x over s e of x. Yep. Now, what's the expected value of a constant times a random variable plus the constant? Remember, one of the properties of the expected value is that it, the expected value of an affine transformation of x is that same affine transformation of the, of, of the expected value of x? OK, so the expected value of this it's always the case that the expected value of ax plus b is equal to a times the expected value of x plus b. Yes? That's, that's true. Um, so in this case, what's the expected value of 1 over S e of x times x minus e of x over S e of x? Yep. 
on the right hand side th no this is this is that times that minus that the expected value of expected value of a sum is the sum of the expected values the expected value of a constant times a random variable is a constant times the expected value so this expected value of a sum is going to be the sum of the expected values the first term, the expected value of a constant times x, is a constant times the expected value of x. And the second term is already a constant. The expected value of this is just itself. OK. So these terms are equal, right? This is just 0. All right, remember, if you take a list and you convert the list to standard units, the mean of the new list is 0. If you take a random variable, you convert the random variable to standard units, the expected value of the new random variable is 0. Okay. What about the standard error of a x plus b? This is equal to the absolute value of a times the standard error of x. Right? b doesn't change the standard error. And what matters about a is its magnitude, not its sign. Okay. So what's the standard error of this random variable in standard units? The standard error of 1 over SE of x times x minus E of x over standard error of x is equal to the absolute value of 1 over the standard error of x times the standard error of x. Okay. Yes. Why are we doing this? Um, well, I want to. Um, we're going to look at. We're looking at what the mean and the, the, the sorry the expected value and standard error are of a variable after you convert the variable to standard units. And the reason we're doing that is we want to get things on the same scale so that we can use the, apply the normal approximation because the, the first step in using the normal approximation is to put things on the same scale. Um, so we're going to, the scale is standard units. So that when you, trans, when you transform to standard units, the new random variable has expected value 0 and has standard error 1. Okay. The normal curve, the standard normal curve, if you thought of it as a probability histogram for a random variable, so if you, if you imagined carving it up into tiny little little bins and letting those bins get infinitesimally narrow, right? So that, that a, a probability of an outcome is going to be the area, an outcome in the little range is the area of the little bin. If you think of this as a probability histogram, divide it smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, what would the expected value of the corresponding random variable be? Well, this thing is symmetric around x equals 0. The balance point is going to be 0. The mean of the corresponding distribution is 0. And it turns out that the standard error, the measure of sort of width of this thing, is 1. So if, if, a, if a random variable had a probability histogram that was approximated perfectly by the normal curve, that random variable would have expected value 0 and standard error 1. So if we want the normal curve to be a good approximation to something, we're going to start by transforming the units so that that something has expected value 0 and standard error 1. Right. So let's, th this is sort of going in the other direction. In this case, the normal curve has been shifted and stretched so that the, the balance point is the expected value of this random variable. We're looking at the draw, we're drawing three times from this box of number tickets. Um, so what's the expected value of the sum of three draws from, from that box of tickets? It should be three times the average of the numbers on the tickets. Right? If you look at those, they balance at 2. 3 times 2 is 6. The expected value should be 6. Expected value is 6. Okay? And then what's the standard error of the sum of three draws going to be? It's going to be the square root of 3 times the standard deviation of the numbers on the tickets in the box. So that turns out to be 2.44. So sort of the typical width of this is plus or minus 2.44 around 6. Okay, on average, things are, things are 2.4, you know, the, 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 
the square root of the expected value of the square of the difference between the random variable and its expected value. <laughs> yes. I think I actually even said that correctly. Um, is is 2.44. All right, that's a measure of how spread out the probability histogram is. Okay, so here we have this theoretical curve. It's the normal curve that's been rescaled so that it balances at six instead of zero, and it's been stretched to have width 2.44 instead of width one. Uh oh. Um, and and the the claim is going to be that. This has something to do with the probability histogram of the sum of draw, three draws from this box. So the question is, does it? Well, let's, let's have a look. So we're now sampling from the box and getting the empirical distribution of, uh, of the sum of three draws. Let's do this a bunch of times so that we're not looking at sampling variability as an issue. All right, now here, in fact, you can only get integer values for the sum of three draws from that box. And the area under this corresponding curve has a lot of, has, you know, it's non-zero it's non area for values in between, not just values, little, little ranges of that box. But if we make this histogram a little bit cruder, then it starts to look like a better approximation. Yes? Okay. It's not going to be a great approximation because the sample size is small. If we increase the sample size, we're going to find that the curve does a better job of fitting the probability histogram. So let's go to sample size 30, and let's up the number of bins to 100, and let's take 1,000 samples. OK, so here there are some values that are a little more common than the normal curve would predict, but we're getting a better fit overall. And if we make the sample size instead of being 30, let's make it be 100. OK, now it's really fitting quite well. Yep. And if we make the sample size be 200, it's really, it's really quite good. Okay, so what happens in general is if you are looking at the sample sum or the sample mean of draws with replacement from a box of number tickets, the normal curve is an increasingly good approximation to the probability distribution of that sample sum or sample mean as the sample size grows. Okay, it's not the number of tickets in the box that matters, it's the number of tickets you pull out of the box that matters. It's the sample sum or sample mean of a large sample with replacement. Now, how good the approximation is depends on the numbers that are in the box. So in this particular case, the numbers in the box have a nice uniform distribution, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The approximation wouldn't be as good if the distribution were really skewed. Right? If, if I'm starting with, if I'm trying to approximate something with a normal curve, the normal curve is symmetric, right? it's not going to approximate something that's skewed very well. Yes? If the distribution of the numbers in the box is really, really skewed, then the distribution of the sample sum or sample mean will be skewed. Not as much, but still skewed. All right, so if I take these numbers and I replace them with um, 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 1. Okay? So I've got now. I've got a 0, 1 box with mostly zeros in it. So what does the population histogram look like for this? Big bump at 0, little, little bump at 1. Yeah, it's right skewed. Okay, most, of the, most of the numbers are 0 and one number is 1. So now if I look at the normal approximation, this is still a big enough sample that this isn't so bad. Let me uh, take this back down to 30, Let's see if you can remember. Okay, so here, the normal curve is kind of wanting there to be some probability out here to the left of zero, but there can't be, right? Because if you add positive numbers, you can never get a negative number, right? Okay, so 
Um, the, but as the number of draws increases, by the time we get to 300 draws, the normal approximation, again, is really not that bad. Okay. So for any fixed distribution of numbers in the box, the normal approximation to the sum or the mean is going to get better and better and better as the number of draws gets bigger. But you can't compare across boxes. Uh, the normal approximation to the distribution of the sample sum of 50 draws from, a, from box A might be better or worse than the normal approximation to the sample sum or sample mean of 1,000 draws from box B. It depends on what numbers are in each of those two boxes. If the numbers in box B are highly, highly skewed, if there's a very, very skewed distribution, it could be worse. If the numbers in box A um, uh, were, followed a nice bell curve in the first place, then the distribution of the sample sum of numbers that follow the bell curve is going to follow the bell curve even better. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so this is the normal approximation, and how do we use it in practice? Well, um, what, what we know is that if we want to find the probability that x is in some range, So normal approximation Okay, so normal approximation to the distribution of the sample sum or sample mean of draws from draws with replacement from a box of numbered tickets, <clears throat> draws at random. And the probability, so let's let's call this random variable x. The probability that x is in some range, um, I, I'm gonna Call these values a is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to b. These are not the same a and b that we had before. Before these were representing the constants in some transformation. This is just some range of values of x. That this um, gets um, This, um, I'll write it this way, is approximately the area under the normal curve between A and B converted to standard units. So how do we convert A to standard units? A minus... Uh, is A a random variable? A is a constant. We're talking about values of this random variable. Okay. So we want to convert A as a value of X to standard units. So it's A minus the expected value of X over the standard error of X. And b minus expected value of x over the standard error of x. OK, so this is a converted to standard units. This is b converted to standard units, because we're talking about the random variable x. It's standard units of x that we care about. Okay. And this approximation gets better and better and better the larger the number of draws is. Approximation can be terrible if the number of draws is small. But eventually, it gets good. Okay. So if x is the sample sum, then what, what is this in symbols? 
let's suppose we're talking about so let's let x be the sample sum of n draws and replacement then ex is equal to what Right, the standard error of x would be the root n times the standard deviation of the box. Yep. And so to convert a to standard units, we're looking at a minus n times the average of the box divided by the square root of n times the SD of the box. Right? And similarly for b. Okay. So if we convert them to standard units and then look at the area under the normal curve for that range, that will be an approximation to the, to the area under the probability histogram for the random variable itself. So that's kind of what was going on in this picture. There's a couple of things that are missing that I want to talk about. Um, let's first of all look at Okay, so here is the standard normal curve. And this applet lets us highlight a range of values. So if we wanted to know the area under the normal curve between minus 0.3 and plus 4, we could just do that and read off the area. It's approximately 61.8%. Okay, so if we had the, if we were looking at the distribution of the sample sum of a bunch of draws from a box of numbers and we wanted to know what's the chance that that sample sum is between minus 0.3 and 4 after you convert to standard, standard units that probability would be approximately 61.8 percent. Okay. So what, val what is the value minus 0.3 in standard units correspond to in original units? So it's minus 0.3 standard errors from the expected value. So it's 0.3 standard errors below the expected value. Right? Okay, and this is four standard errors above the expected value. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah. That that's it, it that's this. In the special case that what x is is the sum of n draws at random with replacement from a box of number tickets, right? Because the expected value of that is n times the average of the box, and the standard error is the root n root n times the standard deviation of the box. <clears throat> All right, it might be easiest to do an example. Okay, okay. Um, if you want to find the area under the normal curve for an arbitrary range, you can do it using this this applet. Um, there is also the probability calculator um, has look at tools um, the probability calculator that you've seen this normal distribution so this is the area under the normal curve standard normal curve has mean zero and standard deviation one um, then you can you can use this to find the range as well we just did minus 0.3 to 4 and we got 61.8 percent this is giving us a few more digits of accuracy 61.788 percent okay um, oops All right, there are three numbers you should memorize regarding the normal curve, and that's these. The area under the normal curve between plus and minus 1 is 68%. Between plus or minus 2, actually plus or minus 1.96, 
is 95%, and between plus or minus 3 is 99.7%. Right? On, on an exam, I will expect you to know those numbers. <clears throat> I will not expect you to know any other areas under the normal curve. It's, um, it, it's a worthwhile exercise to figure out how to take areas that are tabulated like this and turn them into more complicated things, but I'm not going to go through that in class. It's something you guys can figure out on, on your own. Um, okay. The other thing that I wanted to say about this is if you're talking about a random variable that can only take integer values, like a binomial random variable, then it can make the normal approximation better to think about um, the bin in the probability histogram that corresponds to the range that you're, that you're, that you're talking about rather than uh, taking the value at the center of the bin. So let me just draw a little picture. Okay, so let's say we have a, a random variable and the probability that random variable is equal to minus 3 um, is, uh, let's, let's make that minus 2 because that's a little more realistic given the way I've drawn the curve. Um, okay, so the area of this bin would be the probability that the random variable is equal to minus 2, right? Everybody, we're all calibrated here? Okay. What's the area under the normal curve under the point over the point minus 2? 0. The area under a curve for any point is 0. Yes? So if I wanted to find out the chance of this random variable is equal to minus 2, finding the area under the curve between minus 2 converted to standard units and minus 2 converted to standard units is going to give me 0. Right? It doesn't help. Yes? So what I want to think about is the fact that if I have this random variable that can only take integer values, the bin that corresponds to minus 2 would go from minus 2.5 to minus 1.5, right? It has some width. And I want to approximate the area of that bin. And so the area under the curve between minus 2.5 and, and minus 1.5 is going to be a better approximation to the area of that bin than simply taking the area under a point. And it's kind of in general true that you want to think about what are the possible outcomes that are contained in some range and expand things to include to, to, so that they correspond to the bins you're trying to find the area of. <clears throat> All right, so if we had, for instance, a binomial random variable. Now remember, a binomial is like the sample sum of draws from a 0, 1 box where you have a a proportion p, a fraction p of the numbers in the box are 1. 1 minus p of the numbers in the box are 0. We draw with replacement a fixed number of times, little n, right? That's, that's got a binomial distribution. So the possible values of a binomial are from 0 on up to the number of draws. And only integer values are possible. When we draw the binomial probability histogram, we typically draw it so that the bins go from, the, the bins are spread around the integers by going up and down by half Yep. So this bin goes from one and a half to two and a half. And if we wanted to find, approximate the area of that bin by the area under the normal curve, what we would do is find the area of the normal curve between one and a half and two and a half after converting those values, one and a half and two and a half to standard units. So let's look at the, the normal curve here. Okay, so the claim is that the area under this curve between one and a half and two and a half is about the same as the area of this rectangle between one and a half and two and a half. So here it's a little too low, there it's a little too high, those things almost balance, so you get about the right area if you, if you go from a half integer to a half integer. So let's actually see how those numbers compare. Um, so if we went from one and a half to two and a half, um, then the actual 
binomial probability is 4.4%. The normal approximation of that is 4.3%. Okay? And we, and it, it does that well because we're, we're really approximating the area of the bin. We're, not, we're, 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 we're trying to say, okay, area under this region, not area under a point or something like that. So if we wanted to find the normal approximation to the probability that this random variable is between 2 and 5 inclusive, that is that 2 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to 5, what, what region would that correspond to? We, we would start at 1 and a half, right? And we would go up to 5 and a half, okay? Because we want to include, if we want to include 2 at all, we want the whole bin that includes 2. If we want to include 5 at all, we want the whole bin that includes 5, okay? And if we did that, then, um, uh, I'm sorry, it was 1 and a half, 5 and a half? Okay. So, 61.2%, 61.1%. Not a bad approximation, and this is just for 10 draws from this box. All right, this box has 50% ones and 50% zeros in it, right? The hypothetical box we're drawing out of to create the binomial distribution. <clears throat> is that skewed? No. What, if we wanted to make the distribution of the numbers in the box skewed, what will we do to P? We make it really close to zero or really close to one. Really close to zero would correspond to right skewed. We'd have a bunch of zeros in the box and only a, a, a few ones. P close to 100% would be left skewed. We'd have a bunch of ones in the box and only a few zeros. If we do that, what's going to happen to the normal approximation? Is it going to get better or worse? Okay. It's going to get worse. So, um, for instance, uh, What's the, the, let's just look at the, the chance from 0 0.5 to, <clears throat> all right, so here we're off by more than a percent, which is actually more than 10% of the answer. Yep, the actual probability that it's between 0 and 1, sorry, that, it, that it's equal to 1 between a half and 1 and a half is about 9%, but the normal approximation is giving us a bigger number. Um, what's going to happen if we go to something like between, okay, in fact, the, area, the, the chance that it's equal to 2, between 1.5 and 2.5, and is about half a percent, and this says that it's 10 to the minus fourth percent, way, 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 way off in a relative manner, you know, the, the relative error is huge. Yes? Yep. We're, um, that, that's what we're building towards. So, um, okay. Um, so here's, let, let's do an exercise. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, when is the normal approximation going to be good for binomial? When's it going to be bad? It's better when P is close to 50% than when P is close to 0 or 100%. It's better the bigger N is. Okay, the larger the number of draws, the better the approximation is. Yes? So the distribution is skewed, so we have to increase the number of draws, right? Right, the normal approximation is going to, so if we, keep, if we keep P the same at 1%, but we increase the number of draws to 100, then um, this approximation is getting better. It's still not very good. If we increase the number of draws to 1,000, now we've got, 8% versus 7.3%, it's getting, it's getting better, right? <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, typically, the normal approximation to the binomial probability distribution is, is not terrible if n times p is at least 5 and n times 1 minus p is also at least 5. And if the range of values that you're trying to find the probability for is pretty close to the expected value. If it's out in the tails, if you're trying to find probability of something that's very small probability one way or the other, then the relative error is going to tend to be larger. <clears throat> um, okay, let's, let's do a couple of examples. All right, so we've got a box of uh, tickets. There's 14 tickets labeled one, the rest are labeled zero. We're going to draw 600 times with replacement from that box. And we want to know what's the chance that the sum of those draws is between 388 and 430. 
So we're drawing 600 times from a 0, 1 box, right? What's the probability distribution of that? OK, so let's call x this thing that we're trying to find the, prob the, the, the underlying random variable, the sum of, of uh, 600 draws from that box. And x has a binomial distribution. with parameters n is 600 and p equals what? Right. 10, 10 fourteenths of the numbers in the box are equal to 1. The rest are equal to 0. OK. So um, the actual probability we're trying to find, not the approximation, the actual probability is what? It would be? The sum from little x equals 388 up to 430 of what? 600 choose x times 10 fourteenths to the x times 4 fourteenths to the 600 minus x, right? That's, that's the actual thing, which is the sum of um, wh whatever that is, about you know, 40 some odd, 42 terms, 43 terms. Messy. You're not going to be able to compute 600 choose x. It's going to overflow your calculator. Yeah, it's OK. This is not <clears throat> OK. So uh, this is what we'd like to know. It's not practical to calculate it. Exactly. Instead, we're going to approximate it <clears throat> by the area under the normal curve. In order to do that, we need to turn 388 into standard units and 430 into standard units. Right? Now, we want 388, but we want 388 as a possible outcome. The bin of the probability histogram that includes 388 starts where? 379.5, right? Because this is a binomial, its possible values are the integers. Okay, so we would, we would, we have, we want to convert 379.5 into standard units. How do we, how do we do that? Oh, sorry, three, 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 three eighty-seven point five. Yeah. Thank you. My, my, yeah, my no short-term memory at all. Right? Turn, forget it. <clears throat> 387.5. Uh, OK, so to convert this to standard units, we would take, this is 387.5 minus the expected value, which is 600 times 10 fourteenths, right? n times p is the expected value. And what's the standard error of this random variable? It's the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. OK. So this would be, this is now the lower endpoint of the range adjusting for the con what's called the continuity correction. Right? We're taking the whole bin that includes the outcome 388. So we're starting at 387.5. And now what's the upper endpoint of the range that we want? It's 430.5 to convert that to standard units we would have 430.5 minus 600 times 10 fourteenths over the same number 600 times 10 fourteenths times 4 fourteenths so that would be the upper end point of the range this is going to give us two numbers and then we want to find the area under the normal curve for that range so we can Ask our good friend Google to calculate this number for us. Um, it looks like, whoops, 387.5 minus um, uh, 600 
times 10 divided by 14. Um, divided by square root of uh, 600 times 10 fourteenths times uh, 4 fourteenths. Okay, minus 3.71. Is that right? Okay, and then in the other direction, this number just needs to become 430.5. Oops, got an extra 0.5. Okay, 0.174. Okay, so let's go back to the applet. Here's an example of it. We want to go from minus 3.71 up to 0 0.17. Okay, and that's 56.9%. So the normal approximation of this probability would be 56.9%. Let's see if I can remember that all the way down to here. Okay. Yes? How do you calculate that percentage without using the applet? The area under the normal curve without using the applet? Um, the, there's no closed form expression for the area under the normal curve. That's why you need to memorize those three values, the area under between the curve between plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 3. But I mean, what it is, mathematically, we're trying to find, we have this curve that looks like 1 over root 2 pi e to the minus x squared over 2. We want to find the area under this curve between minus 3.71 and plus 0.174. Right? This, this integral does not have a closed form expression. It, it just ha you just have to evaluate it numerically. And the applet is evaluating it for you numerically. So you need to memorize the numbers between plus or the area under the curve between plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 3. Those are, those are the only numbers you'll need to know. <clears throat> yes? What were, so the question is why wasn't it 387, why was it 387 and a half? And it's back to this idea here that for a binomial, <clears throat> let's make this a little bit bigger number, the, poss the, the sort of the bins in the probability histogram that are representing the probabilities, you know, what, what, if I wanted to find the probability that this was between four and eight, what region would I be looking at the area of? I'd be looking at the area starting at three and a half in order to capture the whole bin that includes four. And I would be going up to, the, to, to eight and a half because that's the end of the bin that includes eight. Okay. It's the area, it's the, area the, the, the whole bin that includes eight is the probability that it's eight. For a binomial, um, the bins are always, they start at a half integer and go to a half integer. Um, for a general, in the general case of, uh, if the values of the numbers in the box aren't integers, then it doesn't really make sense to apply this continuity correction. The values in the box are integers, but they're not sort of equally spaced, so the outcomes aren't equally spaced like this. 
it's kind of a coin toss as to whether it'll end up being a better approximation or a worse approximation if you use the continuity correction. But I'm, I'm asking you to sort of do it. If the possible values are integers, then you know that if the possible value of the random variable is only an integer, then, it, then if you're asked for the probability that it's at least 2 and no bigger than 7, you should start at 1.5 and, and go to 7.5. <clears throat> yes? This, this is the standard error of a binomial. Um, OK, so what we just saw numerically is that this is approximately, what was it, 56.9% was that we got? OK, 56.9%. Okay. And we did this not by doing the integral, but by highlighting the area under the, uh, under the curve. And that, that did the integral for us numerically. <clears throat> OK, so the question was, where's this denominator coming from? So if, if x has a binomial distribution like that, then maybe I should just write it over here. The expected value of x is n times p. And the standard error of x is the square root of n times p times 1 minus p. In this case, n times p, this is 600 times 10 fourteenths. And this is the square root of 600 times 10 fourteenths times 4 fourteenths. Okay. <clears throat> yes? Is the one, two, and three? I'm, 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 I'm not following you. I'm sorry. OK, so that wouldn't solve this problem. OK, because this problem required you to know the area under the curve between minus 3.7 and plus 0.174. But if, if this had worked out on an exam, this would work out so that this would be something like the area between minus 2 and plus 1, which you could work out. Yes? So we would have like these various random numbers that were um, that It would end up being it would end up being a nice integer. Yes. Um, let's pretend that the range that I asked for ended up giving you, let's say, minus three to plus one. Okay. Then let's just do what you would need to do to, to turn that by, by knowing the, the other two numbers, how that would work. OK, so let's, what is the area under the normal curve? All right, so what do we know? We know that the area between, so we're, we're looking for, take it back, we're looking for the area between here and here. Right? That's what we're looking for. What do we know? We know that the area between minus 3 and 3 is 0.997. Right? We know the area between minus 1 and 1 is 0.68. We know that the curve is symmetric. Yes? So what's the area? So we're going to divide this area up into two pieces: the area between minus three and zero, and the area between zero and one. What's the area between minus three and zero? If the area between minus three and three is this, and the curve is symmetric, the area between minus three and zero is going to be half of this. Okay. So this area, from there to there, is 0.997 over 2. And this area is going to be half of 0.68. So this piece is 0.68 over 2. So we add those numbers together. That's the area between minus 3 and 1. OK? <clears throat> sure. Yes? Yes. So this is, the question is, is this the same thing as the square root of n times the SD, the box? Yeah, if you remember, for a 0, 1 box, okay, 
you have the zero one box with a fraction p of tickets labeled one, then the average of the box is equal to p, the SD of the box is equal to the square root of p times one minus p. Okay, so the square root of n, in this case the square root of n times the square root of p times one minus p is just the square root of n times p times one minus p. <clears throat> Other questions? Okay. Um, all right, so the normal curve can give you a good approximation to some probability histograms. In particular, it, if you take the sample sum or sample mean of draws from a box of number tickets, then the probability that that random variable is in some range is approximately the area under the normal curve for the same range once you convert the range to standard units. You convert the lower end point to standard units, convert the upper end point to standard units. That approximation can be good or bad. The approximation gets better and better the larger the number of draws is. The approximation is better if the distribution of the numbers in the box is symmetrical than if it's skewed. Okay. <clears throat> um, because you're approximating it by a curve that's symmetrical, not skewed. And so far, so good? Okay, uh, it turns out that, remember that a hypergeometric is like the sample sum of draws without replacement from a zero one box. The normal approximation uh, to the hypergeometric isn't bad provided the sample size isn't too big compared to the number of tickets in the box. You'd still use the finite population correction to adjust the standard error for the fact that you're drawing without replacement rather than with replacement. Um, and the normal approximation of the result is going to be pretty good, uh, provided the number of draws is reasonably large, just like it needs to be for a binomial, provided the fraction of tickets labeled 1 in the box isn't too close to 0 or 100%. The fraction of tickets labeled 1 in the box we usually write as g over n for hypergeometric rather than p, but it's the same thing. Um, and provided the sample size isn't too close to, is, isn't too big. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about Markov and Chebyshev. So these are really exactly analogous to Markov's inequality and Chebyshev's inequality for lists. So Markov's inequality for lists says the fraction of elements in the list that are greater than or equal to A can't be any bigger than the mean of list, of the list divided by A if every element of the list is zero or bigger, right? If you have a non-negative list of numbers, then the fraction of elements that are big can't be that, can't be that big, or the mean would be big, right? Can't be sort of a large multiple of the mean. Turn that into the language of random variables. The fraction of elements in the list is like the probability that you observe a certain value, right? Probabilities are like fractions of the elements. And the, the mean of a list is like the expected value of the random variable. You have a random variable that, that is non-negative in the sense that the probability of the random variable is at least 0 is 1. Right? So there's, there's 0 chance that the random variable is negative. There's 100% chance the random variable is at least 0. Then the chance that that random variable is bigger than some threshold value is no bigger than the expected value of the random variable divided by that threshold value. Okay, do the symbols make sense? <laughs> All right, let, let's just take uh, an example. I'm, I'm tossing, um, uh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna toss a coin until the first time that it lands heads. Okay, so I've got a, that's a geometric random variable, right? Okay. Um, what's the chance that 
I have to toss 10 times or more until the first chance, until the first time that I get ahead. Okay, I could calculate that, right? What would that be in symbols? So x is the number of tosses the first head. We've got a fair coin independent tosses. Okay, so the probability that x is greater than or equal to 10 How, how would I actually calculate this? Get the exact number. What's the probability distribution? Okay, it's geometric with parameter p equal a half. So what's, what's the chance? So I, I, this would be the sum from, let's say, j, we'll call it i. I equals 10 to infinity of so the chance it takes exactly 10 tosses, chance it takes 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Maybe better to write it this way, a half to the i minus 1 times a half. I have to get tails the first i minus 1 times, and then I have to get heads the ith time. Trials are all independent. Rings a bell? OK. All right. So I could do that sum, or I could take 1 minus the chance that it takes 9 or fewer, then I would only be adding nine things and then subtracting that from one. But if I wanted to just very quickly get a, get a bound using Markov's inequality, what could I do? What's the expected value of x? Okay, 1 over p, which is 2. OK. OK, so the probability that x is greater than or equal to 10 is less than or equal to e of x over 10, right, is a fifth. Right, it's 2 over 10 is a fifth. All right, because the number of tosses can't be negative, right? The probability that it takes a positive number of tosses is 1. This is a non-negative random variable. OK? This going to be a good bound? What's the chance it takes one toss? Chance it takes one toss is chance it takes two tosses is chance it takes three tosses is okay we're 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 already th this is already bigger than 0.8 right this is 0.75 this is 0.8 we subtract that from one we're already we're already below this. Right, we start now taking 1 16th, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to get, OK, so this bound is not going to be that great. But it's still a bound. People have any idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> Am I just talking to myself? 
I'm back to talking to myself again. OK, let's, um, let's use the, this little applet here to find um, the actual probability. Oops, where did it just go? I've lost the applet I was looking for. There it is. OK. So let's suppose that we have a geometric distribution where the probability of success is a half. And we know what, want to know what's the chance that x is greater than or equal to 10. OK. Oh, it looks like it's actually better bound than, oh no, it's, sorry, it's 0.195%. And our bound is 20%. OK, so we're off by a factor of about 100. <laughs> no, point, point, no, so, yeah, th yeah, right. So it's not from 0.2% to 20% is a factor of 100. Okay. It's an upper bound, but it's not a very good upper bound in this case. Okay. Yes? Um, Clarify what it means. So it is true that this probability is less than a fifth, but in fact, it is a lot less than a fifth. Okay? A hundred times less. <laughs> yes? Oh, Markov's inequality is not going to help us because this particular random variable doesn't have a distribution that makes Markov's inequality sharp. So the, the kind of distribution that makes Markov's inequality sharp only has two possible values. This has an infinite number of possible values. So it, it, it's just, it, it, it's always true, but it's not always a very good bound. And, um, yes? So is there any reason Markov's inequality If we have a, a random variable that can't be negative, that, that probability that it's negative is zero, then Markov's inequality gives us a quick and dirty way to find an upper bound on the chance that that random variable is very big. Okay, so it gives us an upper bound on a, on a probability that the random variable is big if the random variable can't be negative. Yes? So you're saying the chance that it takes more than 10 passes to get your fifth edge is less than 10 Yeah, it's, it, it, it can't be any, Markov's says it can't be any bigger than a fifth. And it isn't. It's a lot less than a bit. <laughs> OK. Yeah. OK. All right. Chebyshev's inequality is, again, analogous for lists and random variables. For lists, it says the fraction of values in the list that are more than k standard deviations from the mean is at most 1 over k squared. For random variable, it says the probability that the random variable is more than k standard errors away from the expected value is at most 1 over k squared. So uh, let's look at an example here. OK, so we have a box of 100 tickets labeled with numbers. We know the mean of the, of the box, and we know the SD of the box but we don't know the numbers in the box. Okay? So we are not going to be able to find the probability distribution of the sample sum or the sample mean, because in order to do that, to find the whole probability distribution, we would need to know what the numbers were in the box, not just their mean and standard deviation. Okay? But we know their mean and their standard deviation. We can find the expected value and the standard error of the sample sum. So we're going to try to use that information to get a bound on the probability that the sample sum is in some range. Right? So what do we got? The average is 40.3. The SD is 0.3. We're looking at the sample sum of a, of a sample of size 7 drawn with replacement from the box. And uh, the question is uh, to find a bound, to learn something about the probability that the difference between the sample sum and 282.1 is 4.05 or bigger. OK, where did 282.1 come from? I made it up, right? But, but what did we make it up to be equal to? <laughs> 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 what, 
what's the expected value of the sample sum of seven draws from that box? It's going to be seven times the mean of the box. Yes? Seven times 40.3 is 282.1. Okay, so this is the expected value of the sample sum of seven draws. What's the standard error of the sample sum of seven draws from this box? Okay, it's going to be the square root of n, square root of 7, times 0.3, the SD of the box. Okay, so what is that? Okay, 0.7937. Okay, so how many standard errors is 4.05? I want 4.05 divided by this, right? Five point one, yes. So five point. This is this is a range of plus or minus five point one standard errors, around the expected value. So what's the chance that it's more than four more than five point one standard errors away? First of all, does this give us an upper bound or a lower bound? Chance that you're very far away. Is it least something or is it most something? At most. It's going to give us an upper bound, right? And this answer should be 1 divided by 5.1 squared. Um, except maybe this isn't parsing squared. Uh, again, this works in the book, but don't submit homework that has math in the blanks. It won't, the, the server won't do the math for you. Um, put, in, put in the actual number. Okay. This makes sense? So we don't know what's in the box, so we don't really know the probability distribution of the sample mean, but we do know the expected value, sort of the sample sum, but we do know its expected value in standard error, and from that we can get a bound without knowing anything else. Yes? Um, well, uh, yeah, so it's the same. The question is, why is it an upper bound? Um, if you take some arbitrary probability histogram, and let's say here's its expected value, okay, and let's say that its standard error is something like this. Okay. And we're asking how much area could there be out here more than k standard errors away from the mean. Okay. And the answer is if there were a lot, then this, if there were a lot of probability out there, then the standard error would be bigger. It would mean that the distribution was broader. Okay, so there, we get an upper bound on this because if there were a lot of mass, a lot of probability out in the tails, that would make the standard error bigger. So if you, if you limit the standard error, then there can't be much probability out there because if there were much probability out there, then the standard error would be bigger. So um, basically, uh, it, it, Chebyshev's inequality is saying the chance that you are, you know, the probability that the absolute value of x minus ex is greater than or equal to k times the standard error of x is less than or equal to 1 over k squared. So the chance that you are k or more standard errors away from the expected value is at most 1 over k squared. <clears throat> All right. Um, Let's start. We got a few minutes. I just start the next thing because uh, it actually ties into um, what uh, the election auditing stuff I was talking about earlier today. All right. Um, an awful lot of statistics has to do with estimating properties of populations 
from random samples. So we, we get some data that are not a complete census. They're a sample instead of a census. And we're trying to learn something about the population based on the sample. And there's an awful lot of technology, theory, experience that tells us how good a job you can do of estimating what's true for a larger group based on a, based on a sample from it. And everything rides on how you draw the sample and what you do with the sample. So <clears throat> parameters are properties of the larger group. Okay? Statistics are things you compute from a sample. So for example, um, you know, we could, the, the average weight of people in this room is a parameter. Right? It's some number that we could compute if we, knew, if we knew everybody's weight. We could estimate the average weight of people in the room by taking a random sample of five people and averaging their weights. That would be a statistic. The sample mean of the weights of five people drawn at random is a statistic. The parameter is the average weight of everybody in the class, okay, everybody in the, in the room right now. Okay, so typically, we are calculating statistics in order to estimate a population parameter. And what's going on with the election auditing that, that, that I'm doing is I'm taking a random sample of ballots and finding the error in that random sample of ballots, the error in how they were counted. So that's a statistic. And what I'm trying to draw a conclusion about is how much error was there in all in counting all the ballots. And if I can conclude based on the random sample that the total error in counting all the ballots didn't amount to the margin, it was less than the margin of victory, then I can conclude that the, right, that the apparent winner is the true winner. But if the amount of error in the whole contest, as in the whole contest could have been bigger than the margin, could have, it, it, the margin might be an error, right? In the, the real situation might be the winners were in a different order. So that a different person won, different candidate won. And error caused the wrong person to appear to win. So I'm trying to draw an inference about a population parameter, how much error there was in counting the votes in all, based on a random sample, how much error there was in counting the votes in some random sample of precincts. Does this, this make sense? OK. <clears throat> so um, just you know, think about some numbers. Uh, we're, we're coming up on another census year, which is always exciting, <laughs> if that's your kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, OK, so um, the, you know, the, the number of Black males age 30 to 44 in a given block in the census, is that a parameter or a statistic? <laughs> statistic, parameter. <laughs> a shrug, it's a shrug. Um, uh, <laughs> it's a parameter, right? It's some property of the whole population. And the census is going to try to estimate that. It's going to go out and look for people in the block. And the number it finds is not going to be exactly equal to the number who actually reside there. Right? So this is a statistic. It's not based on a random sample, but it's still a statistic. It's, it's, it's coming from some sample. Okay. Um, why on earth would you want to sample? Why do I want to sample in doing election auditing? What's the alternative to sampling? Counting all of it, right? So do I really want to go count you know, 180,000 votes in Marin County in order to figure out what happened? No. I'd like to count some much smaller number and extrapolate from that in order to do things efficiently. OK. See you guys.